There are times in life when you get asked questions regularly. The question I most often get asked is why? Why don't I like HMS York and HMS Exeter? Well, I'm going to explain that before we get into them. And this is going out on the 5th of April, but it's being recorded on the 25th of January. Simple. They're unimaginative. They are derivatives. They are basically someone going, here is the county class. It's a perfectly good design. I want to make something which is a slightly less capable county that'll be cheaper. So all I'll do is cut off one of the turrets and cut a bit of this and cut a bit of that. And uh, yeah. I got myself a cruiser. <sighs> the Royal Navy has a model, the Nelson class, of how to build an efficient ship. Now, I don't like the layout of the guns on the Nelson class. I admit that. I think it should, C should be the raised one, not B, and I think the extra length that required, it would not be a problematic thing in terms of the advantages it would bring. But that's me. However, there are the Miyoko class. They have the raised turret, a la Nelson class. There are lots of designs which have it as a forward system with six guns. You could even go for two triple turrets. And then you'd have your six guns forward. You might find that your triple turrets are efficient enough, your design's efficient enough, you can end up with a nine gun ship, which would be wonderful, but probably not, especially if you're trying to go for less weight. But it's just done so... You have, and I will add this quickly in, when I pause like that, I'm not just pausing for effect, and it is sometimes fun to try and edit them out, but it's usually because I want to use the correct word. I'm an academic. I know the value of words. I know their import. And I want to use the correct one. And whilst working it out in advance and having a script like I do next to me is useful, sometimes when I hear it speak, it doesn't, doesn't have the impact I want it to. And that is the same with York and Exeter. They are practically two separate classes. They might as well be because they are so different. They are the Royal Navy building a Type B cruiser. And here is the really big problem I have with this. Okay. All right. Under the treaty tonnage limitations, the Royal Navy has been considering a Type B cruiser, i.e. a not as good cruiser, for a long time at this point. So why do they not have a better design? And then I go into the archives, and I find they do have better designs. And they don't go through with them. So, York and Exeter aren't even really the Type B cruiser, in my mind. They are the cut price county. Because what they've done is they've... taken something, let's say a glass, like this, and they've just cut off a quarter and gone, yeah, you go, there's 75% price. 
Oh, hang on. It's not 75% of the price, is it? No. It's a 25, arguably more, percent cut in capability. And yet, it's not a massive cut in price. There are things I don't expect of some countries. If it's France, I am pleased when they produce a beautiful looking ship. I am unsurprised when they produce an ugly looking ship because the French will always deliver either a glorious vessel or a vessel which you have to go, I want to put on my shade to not look at you. The Americans will always find a way to put extra guns on a design. They always do. It's part of the beauty of their navy and their history. It's they will always find a way to stick bigger, more numerous guns on the design than anyone else would on that design. The Japanese will build it top heavy and fast, but it will look Japanese. And the British, well, here's my problem. The British at the same time as they do this also are working on the Leander class and all the later six inch cruisers, the design development for them. They have so many ideas, so many gorgeous ideas going through their design uh, you know, institutes. They'll produce the air fusers, which, again, I not wouldn't be having this debate of versus the Le Leanders. Why? Because when you look at an air fuser class, you do not think you're a Leander that's had a 25% of you cut off. You just don't. The air fusers look like they're designed as they're supposed to be. They look at they have the portions and the shape. They don't look like they you have taken something and you have just cut a chunk off it and gone, there, done. The concept of the cut price county is really interesting. The Type B cruiser has been around for a while. The idea was an eight and a half thousand ton vessel, which would be enough to deter the best a country could get on the Washington Table Treaty, but wouldn't cost as much. That was the idea. Well, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they weren't aiming for 8,000 tons to, you know, so they could get five for the price of four in tonnage. Eight and a half thousand tons makes it more complicated. But they've had it around for a while, and above is a plan for a full fat county, and Below is the plan that you have for York. And it just doesn't look like the level of thought that has been applied to it has been applied to it. It doesn't. Almost since 1920, when the Washington Naval Treaty goes into force, they start work on this, on the Type A and the Type B cruisers. And the Type A start construction first. Yes, they do, because the Royal Navy needs them far more than they need the Type Bs. They've got the Hawkins class, they've got all sorts of vessels that can fulfill the Type B role at that time. They need the Type A cruisers first. That just gives them more time. And you already have existing models for how to produce an efficient ship in terms of displacement. 
when displacement is your criteria. And let's be honest, that's the criteria of Nelson or Romney. If it hadn't been the criteria, they would have had the extra boilers. They would have probably had the arrangement of guns, which I've talked about. And they would probably have been able to do 28 knots. I'm not saying they'd have been fast battle crews or anything, but 28 knots, maybe a little higher, um, maybe a little less actually, but you know, roughly 28 knots would have been their aim. Not battle cruiser speed, but certainly fast battleship speed. But the displacement tonnage wasn't allowed, so that didn't happen. A decade almost, of thought and development and that is what you produce for your Type B cruiser. Full fat designs, as we can see, are, and as I've been over, they haven't got that heavy but it's an interesting note the london class were 909,840 tons on average and standard now if we consider that the london class were 1340 tons heavier than the type b was supposed to be so the London class is sort of the more closer comparison. Here's the cut price design. Displacement for York, 8,250 tons in standard, 10,350 tons in full load. Exeter, 8,390 tons standard, 10,410 tons full load. Got them under the requirement. That's good. Length, roughly 160 meters. 175 meters overall. Uh, beam on York was 17.37 meters. On Exeter, 17.68 meters. So Exeter was slightly fatter. Draft was roughly the same. Power was roughly the same. And top speed, roughly the same. Complement, York, 623. Exeter, 630. Armament, six 18-inch guns. Four four-inch guns in single mounts. 8.5 Vickers machine guns in two quad mounts. Six, six torpedo tubes in two treble mounts uh, for 21-inch torpedoes. And here is the really annoying thing, because I'm, I'm trying to be polite. I'm trying to be good and focusing on the design aspects. And I know that's the fairer place to, weigh, uh, to put it, and that's the fairer discussion to have, to focus in on the design aspects and compare the design. But this is the thing. These ships were cancelled by the Labour government to save money. That's why they cancelled the full-fat county, counties. And then these were supposed to be built to be the cheap option. They are supposed to be the cheap option. The option that the government would get and would make up the money. Okay, that they would, you know, they would be able to build them in enough numbers that they could give the Royal Navy the firepower and force it needed. They cost 1.8 million on average, rather than the 2.1 million of a full fat county. And that is based on the highest estimated saving of £300,000 per ship. 
Many of my colleagues would tell you that the most commonly accepted saving is rather £250,000. And I have a friend of mine who's an economic historian, a very skilled and learned individual that really knows their economics. And when they worked through this, because I've talked about the candies enough that they went off and decided to have a look into it as comparison for a journal article, which they're actually going to be publishing soon on costs of government, government saving money in the 20s and 30s. Their estimate was that York and Exeter, on average, cost £150,000 <coughs> less than a full fat county. <clears throat> In simple terms, if you go with my friend's estimate, which I would because if anyone knows how to figure out government finances, they do. The cumulative saving of both ships was equivalent to one seventh of the price of a full fat county cruiser. So I could have built the two full counties and I'd only have had to find £300,000 more for the Royal Navy's budget over three years. Sounds like a lot of money to someone who is to an individual who's buying a house, to a government whose budgets are measured in thousands of millions. Three hundred thousand pounds is not a lot, and I would argue the reason why this is the case is because they are so unimaginative. I mean, there's, there are so many better options. If we compare it to a Norfolk's, which are 10,400 tons, and they weigh an average of 8,250 tons, let's go with York's weight of 8,250 tons to make it more likely, um, rather than trying to justify the weight differential compared to London's, because then it's even harder to justify. Four counties at 10,400 tons average is 41,600 tons. Five of these vessels is out of York's is 41,250 tons. Okay. 20 counties is 208,000 tons. 25 cut price counties, or cut prices as I call them, is 206,250 tons. You, you you can't nicely get them into there's always going to be a, a a tonnage different control which again isn't necessarily a bad thing with the treaty system but it's annoying and again it's something which a well thought through design like you would expect from the british should have considered and should be working it in through But here's the really big problem, okay? So, and I'm going to sound like those people who were look at adding up guns before the Battle of Tashima. 25 cut prices are 150 8-inch guns. 20 full fat counties are 160 8-inch guns. Less ships, but more guns. By a margin.
And that's not really a good scenario to be in if you're expecting these ships to do any of the works which you would expect of a full fat county. So, we sit there and go, the justification for these ships is trade protection. Okay, but and there are going to be people screaming at this screen going, oh, well, you know, Alex, you're, you're, you're asking too much. You're comparing them to a full fat county and you're saying they're not as equivalent. Well, no, because a full county is a beautifully balanced design. It's not a supreme in any respect, but it is an 80% solution across the board for pretty much all its roles, which means it's a very useful ship. It doesn't mean it's probably going to win any top trumps because other ships are always going to be better than if they are focused on specific areas, but it's an 80% solution for most of its for the vast majority of its roles. And thanks to the war service, especially that of Exeter's, which is famous, of course, the Battle of River Plate, people tend to gloss over the fact that the cut prices are not. They are not 80% in their roles. It's just not an 80% solution. Saying that, Exeter has a fairly active, fairly interesting career. She's built at Devonport Dockyard in Plymouth. She, of course, is sunk during the Second Battle of Java Sea, but before that, she ha does many, many other things. I will add that her wreck has been found to have been destroyed by illegal salvagers between 2014 and 2016. Uh, It's sad when that sort of thing happens. It is. She was ordered two years after York. And so incorporates design improvements and other things. In, you know, basically they've looked at York and they've gone, we can make her better. And no point have gone, did we have a good design in the first place? Did we? Did we really? No, we didn't. Okay, let's go and go and do this again. As you can see, she has, she looks like, if you are just going from the aft mast forward, she could pass for a regular county class cruiser. Not perfectly, but she certainly wouldn't look too dissimilar to one. But as you can see, she's been cut down even more in comparison. When she first goes into the service, She's assigned to the second cruiser squadron of the Atlantic Fleet. Serves there from 1931 to 33. Then she's assigned to the American West Indies Station in 1934. And barring a temporary deployment to the Mediterranean during the Abyssinian Crisis of 35 to 36, she serves there till 39. At the outbreak of the Second World War, she's part of Commodore Harwood's South American Division. An Ajax. And she's commanded by Captain Frederick Bell, one of the characters of the Royal Navy in the, 19, in the 1930s and World War II. He's quite well known among, amongst the fleet and he's considered a very good, very capable officer. She was, of course, critical in the battle with the Grass Bay. She was critical the battle with Dr. Grass Bay. She really was. She was the big target as far as the Grass Bay was concerned, even though at one point they seemed to have thought that she was a light cruiser. <sighs> well. In the end, Langstorff focuses 
Moses's firepower on her, and she stands up to it very well. For a design which, as I said, seems so derogative, uh, so derivative. They have really built a good, solid ship, and she is good. However, there's a reason she's in the South America station. There's a reason she then goes to the Far East. It's that she's not really wanted around. The Royal Navy doesn't really know what to do with York and Exeter. They don't really want them in positions where they are likely to engage equivalent opponents of heavy cruisers because they weren't built for that. Remember, they are a Type B cruiser. Their role is to fight other cruisers in a deterrence fashion, escort convoys. She could have arguably been, arguably been deployed to the Mediterranean as part of the convoy escort of forces there. Certainly with her speed and her firepower, she could have helped out with that. But probably sending her to the Far East to be a, another heavy cruiser in the region. Even a weaker one. And to escort convoys and deal with potential surface raiders out there was probably a sensible, viable use of that. She deployed to the Far East under command of Captain WNT Beckett. He'd re relieved Bell in December 1940. She deployed to the Far East under the command of Captain Oliver Gordon. Now, technically, Bell had been... Re re <clears throat> Now, technically, Bell had been relieved by Captain W.N.T. Beckett in December 1940. The trouble is, he didn't prove that well, and unfortunately died at Sultash Hospital following complications of exploratory surgery to repair poison gas injuries he received earlier in his career. So his replacement was Oliver Gordon. And that's who took her to the Far East. Unfortunately, she arrived at Singapore during the afternoon of 10th of December, too late to support Prince, Repulse and Prince of Wales, as they'd been, both been sunk earlier that day. Um, she hadn't been ordered to Singapore till the 8th of December. She was at that time escorting convoys. And it's one of those interesting scenarios is what happens if she is ordered there earlier to Singapore. If she's part of the reinforcements of 4C and arrives earlier. So before 4C goes out, they actually have Exeter and other ships with them. Would that give them a better defense against the air attacks? Who knows? Would that spread out the air attacks more? Maybe. Because again, from high up, she has the same gun layout as, about, as the Royal Navy's battle cruisers, Renown and Repulse. So that is a slight advantage, but I hope no one was thinking that when they were actually designing these ships. She then takes part in something called the Gasper Sortie, where she goes off as part of ABDA. So she's under the command of Rear Admiral Carl Dorman, and of the Dutch Navy, and she's along with an Australian light cruiser, three Dutch destroyers, and six American destroyers. They go off to try and deal with a Japanese attack on, well, Japanese forces are heading towards the Dutch East Indies. They get on the repeated aerial attack, and they get damaged. But they're still available and around when they take part in the first battle of the Java Sea. Of course, I've done a full video on Exeter and her sinking, so I'm trying not to go over too much ground here again. But she eventually gets sunk 
in the second Battle of Java Sea. She's damaged in the first Battle of Java Sea, but she's sunk in the second Battle of Java Sea. When she's intercepted by Naki, Haguro, Miyoko, and Ashigara. Which... Mm. Are Japanese full-fat heavy cruisers. HMS York. Cunningham's Conundrum. Not sure if he ever used that word to describe her, but he does seem to have considered her a bit of a conundrum. She is sunk in the 22nd of May, 1941, but isn't actually scrapped till uh, the 3rd of March, 1952. She's not been doing much good to the Royal Navy. She's been basically sitting in Suda Bay for that entire time. She gets an interesting career. She starts out being built by Palmer Shipbuilding and Iron Company in Yarrow. And when she's completed in 1930, she first becomes the flagship of Vice Admiral Sir Reginald Drax, then his successor, Vice Admiral Matthew R. Best of the 2nd Cruiser Squadron of the Home Fleet. Pretty nice role. Between 1931 and 34, she's commanded by Captain Richard, Richard Bevan, who was succeeded in Bermuda by Captain H.P. Boxer. She then served as the flagship of the 8th Cruiser Squadron on the North American West Indies Station, which is based in the Royal Navy Dockyard on Ireland Island in Bermuda. She would often serve there alongside Exeter, her sister, but she had quite a good life out there. She was actually dry docked in Admiralty Floating Dock Number 1, being the largest vessel to have been lifted by that dock at the time and having required the almost complete reconstruction of AFD-1 in order to accommodate the docking of ships of the larger ships of the HRS York class. It's a lovely phraseology, but basically that means that the... Uh, Floating dock had been designed for ships not this big. And there is another reason to have the Class B cruiser, and actually think about it, because whilst the Royal Navy does have infrastructure around the world, that infrastructure is not without limits. And you either have to pay to make it bigger, or reconstruct it, as you do with AFD-1, or you have to design your ships according to your infrastructure. In 1939, she spent most of her career in the North America West Indies Station, a barring again going to the Mediterranean Fleet during 1935-36 for the Second Italian-Abyssinian War, i.e. the Abyssinian Crisis. She refer returned to the America Station at a break of war in September 1939. It's based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and takes part in operations from there. In early April 1940, York and the squadron she's been assigned to, 1st Cruiser Squadron, were assigned to carry troops under Plan R4, the British plan to invade Norway. Troops were disembarked on the 8th of April when um, the British learnt of um, the imminent German invasion of Norway and the squadron, under command of Cunningham, joined the Balkan home fleet already at sea to try and intercept this attack. Take for April, the destroyer HMS Eclipse was badly damaged by air attack, and York was detailed to tow her back to Lurik for the repairs. Yes. Oh. The B class cruiser was considered the best asset to tow a destroyer back to harbour. Not using another destroyer, using the cruiser. You would expect. Need to destroy a tow back and a, a destroyer is not enough. You'd probably think of a light cruiser, but they go for the type B cruiser. Then she and Manchester and Birmingham, two town class cruisers, definitely never considered to be type B cruisers, uh, ferried the 1st Battalion of the Green Howards and other troops from Rosyth to Andalhees and Mold. 
between the 24th and 25th of April. She was back in the UK by the 26th of April, but she was one of the ships used to evacuate British and French troops from Nansos, along with the uh, three French transports and, of course, a number of British destroyers, including a number of tribal class destroyers. She took part in the Battle of Cape Pesero in the Mediterranean, where she, after, where she joined the 3rd Cruiser Squadron, based Alexandra, in September of 1940, after escorting a convoy around the Cape of Good Hope. Very good role for these groups. Very much escort convoys. And if they had been built, if the... One of the things that discredits them, in my mind, is the fact that the Labour government only builds two. Because if they really were supposed to make the most numbers out of time just to escort convoys, you needed to build a lot more. And yes, you've got treaty tonnage limitations, but... Considering the amount of politics that I've played around with the treaties, as I've been into, eh, you could have got a, you could have done it if you'd wanted to, but they didn't want to spend the money. In January 1941, she was escorting the tanker RAF Bamberleaf and four flower class corvettes to Suda Bay Crete set up for that group to set up there. She was then dispatched, went back home, took part in Operation Lustra, uh, protecting troop convoys from Egypt to Greece, and then is put into Suba Bay. Unfortunately, she's disabled by two Italian explosive motor, motor torpedo boats which were launched from the destroyers Francisco Crispi and Quintino Sella on the 26th of March 1941. Uh, these old destroyers have been fitted with cranes to operate these assault craft, and the six motor boats entered the bay, uh, led by Tenente de Vesello, Louis, uh, Luigi Fangano. A nice long name. And they attacked York, a pair of them. A second pair attacked Hercules, a tanker. And the last pair, another ship of tanker, at anchor. Three of the attacking boats had problems. They mechanical or human, and which due to the temperatures, they still didn't work. The other three all successfully attacked their targets. Two of those managed to hit York. All surviving Italian uh, and sailors fell into British hands afterwards. The British got some of the bravest Italian sailors, and in return they lost a Type B cruiser. The submarine HMS Rover was actually used to supply electrical power to operate the cruiser's guns for anti-aircraft defence, until Rover herself was severely damaged by air attack and had to be towed away for repairs. Then German bombers managed to inflict further attack, um, on the 18th of May, and she's damaged beyond repair. When the Allies begin to evacuate Crete, York's wreck was, uh, how do I put this, made permanent with demolition charges. She's a Type B cruiser. And honestly, the thing is, her end really doesn't do her justice, because her and Exeter, are, even though they're Type B cruisers, they're still useful. In fact, she's taken out by torpedo boats, well, motor boats packed with explosives. It's not a reflection of her. It's a reflection of the harbour defences and the viability of the position they put themselves in. It's also a, a, a reflection of the fact that Taranto had not been enough of a victory. And I've been over this with Toronto before, and discussed it, in that due to Eagle's absence, because of the damage she sustained in previous operations, because of which she'd had to do because she had no other choice, because they didn't have enough carriers, because they'd lost two carriers earlier in the war, they hadn't taken them out enough targets. Now, would that have stopped the Italians launching their attack? Who knows? But, 
if you'd taken out more of the battleships and probably also some of the heavy cruisers as well in the Ranto Raid by having an increased air attack, well, you might have been operating your heavy cruisers. The Arrow of Cunningham might have been operating his heavy cruisers and his other heavier assets slightly differently. So they might not have had the target of opportunity of York sitting in Suda Bay. Right, why have I brought up Palmer's Shipbuilding and Iron Company? Well, because lots of people seem to be responding and liking when I talk about the shipyards a bit. And Palmer's seems to be a fairly good one to talk about. They were established in 1852 by Charles Mark Palmer as the Palmer's Brothers and, uh, Brothers and Co. in Yarrow. They launched John Bowes in that year, and that ship is special because it was the first iron screw collier. By 1900, the business was known as Palmer's Shipbuilding and Iron Company. At the time, besides building ships, it also, of course, as its name suggests, produced its own steel, and as well as other metals. And its products included things like reed water tube boilers and marine steam engines, so they built them all themselves. Palmer's in 1902 occupied roughly 100 acres, or 41 hectares, of Yarrow, and this included... 1.2 kilometers of the southern bank of the River Tyne, employing roughly 10,000 people. This is not a small enterprise. In 1910, Sir Charles Palmer's interest in the business was acquired by Lord Furness, who, as chairman, would expand the business by acquiring lease of a new graving dock um, from Robert Stevenson and Company. Mm-hmm. Engineering companies, it goes around and around, but it's the same names which keep turning up. And in 1919, Palmer's laid down the SS Gerasopa, uh, which was sunk by Joe Newbert in 1941, causing loss of 84 lives and 200 tons of silver. Ooh. They survived the Great Depression. Palmer's actually in 1931 posted a loss of £88,867, equivalent of £6 million today. However, the company received a moratorium from its creditors in order to extend repayment. And in 1933, the company's unsecured creditors met in London and agreed to extend the moratorium for a further six months. This enabled them to keep going. A little bit longer. However, they didn't keep going forever. And in 1934, they collapsed. The company's blast furnaces and steelworks, which covered 37 acres, were put up for auction. Yarrow Yard was sold to National Shipbuilder Securities, who closed it down in order to sell it, which caused massive unemployment and led to the Yarrow March. After the shipyard closed, Sir John Jarvis, a noted, in, a noted industrialist, um, lobbied that the site was used for an en uh, used the engine shop as a steel foundry for another eighteen months. The company retained the yard at Hebden, which they bought from the Robert Stevenson Company, and that was subsequently acquired by Armstrong Whitworth, which became Palmer's Hebden Company. Vickers Armstrong sold the Palmer's dock to Swan Hunter, and they developed it into the Hepburn Shipbuilding Dock. The facility was in turn acquired. Requir the facility was then in turn acquired from. Receivers of Swan Hunter by Tyne T's Dockyard in 1904, who sold it to Camel Laird in 1995. Camel Laird, of course, entered receivership in 2001, and then the dock was acquired by AMP Group. The yard, remained, the yard remains in use as a ship repair and refurbishment facility. AMP Group are pretty well known. They're the people down in Falmouth and a few other places, and they are one of the 
better British shipbuilding companies. They certainly don't get enough knowledge of them. But the point about Palmer's is this was a firm which had built HMS Queen Mary. This was a firm which had built almost a dozen battleships. This was a firm which had built lots of cruisers for the Royal Navy, lots of destroyers, lots of other ships, and had built a huge numbers of especially. And the recession killed them. And the recession killed them for two reasons. One, no one was ordering ships. And two, the government wasn't ordering the ships it was promising to. They put out a lot of money and a lot of investment to build HMS York. The whole plan was that they would do that and then the government would order more. The government does order one more. It doesn't order it from them. It orders it from a Royal Navy dockyard. Which is fine. Because that's the better deal for the government. And it's better for the taxpayer. But it means Palmas goes bankrupt. And now... That graveyard, and the graving yard and dockyard is owned by A and P Group. And it's the largest dry dock on the east coast of the UK. Its length is 259 meters long. It's 45.7 meters wide and has a depth of, uh, depth of 5.6 meters below the datum of navigation charts. Facility that heaven also has eight cranes which lift up to 100 tons. Steel workshop, joinery workshop and engineering workshop. A very good facility and its history comes back from these people so well why have i decided exeter york and the canaris class into two videos because this one was going to sound a bit depressing honestly it was because it was always partially going to be a bit of a rant I tried to make it not, but it's partially going to. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're enjoying the Cruiser series coming along, the year of the Cruiser. And, well, thank you for watching. I hope you're still watching when this video goes out. After all, I'm recording it in January and it's for April. <laughs> Take care, have a nice day, and hope you're having fun.